The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Two people killed in an accident on the city's north side that also sent several people to the hospital. This came in a little after 5 in the 200 block of Pinewood. That's behind the CPS Customer Service Center on San Pedro. This is still a pretty active scene right now. As many as 16 units responded. We believe there are three vehicles involved, one of them under that tree you're seeing there, one in the intersection, and then one down the block. Four people taken to a hospital. San Antonio police now sorting out what exactly happened leading up to this deadly accident. One person rushed to the hospital after a shooting on the city's west side. We brought it to you at the end of the 5 o'clock news. It happened around 510 near the corner of West Poplar and Northwest 26th Street. Not a lot of details on this shooting, but fire officials did tell us they took one person to the hospital with a gunshot wound. We're working to get more information. A Southtown bar owner says she was forced to close her business down for hours after someone posted to social media that they planned to go there and spread the coronavirus. Even though she says the man never showed up, the damage had already been done. Devin Clark explains and also tells us why there could be legal consequences. So yesterday, um, our social media started receiving uh, tweets and some direct messages from uh, friends of the Friendly Spot. The Friendly Spot owner, Jody Bailey Newman, says the messages showed a disturbing Snapchat that had been circulating on social media, which appeared to have been created by a man who visited the bar and restaurant before. Saying that he had uh, tested positive for COVID, that he was heading to the gym, and then he was heading to the friendly spot ice house um, to quote unquote spread it. Newman says she and her staff immediately jumped into action to prepare for the worst. Determined that he was not there currently. Um, they gave last call to the customers that were there. We shut our gate as to stop any new customers from coming in. As seen here, a vigorous cleaning process followed. Newman says they lost about eight hours of business. St. Mary's University criminal law professor Gary Ramey says that the person who made the post could potentially be sued for damages. It's also possible to hold somebody criminally responsible for threatening another person with an assault. So assault includes threats. Ramey adds that in some cases, the coronavirus could be viewed as a weapon. While Newman didn't go into detail about plans for legal recourse, she did say if the man who made the post shows up there again, he won't receive a friendly welcome. And as you can see, the friendly spot is back open today. And we reached out to San Antonio police to find out if any charges are going to be brought forward in this case. They say they do not have that information at this time, but investigators are looking into the matter. Reporting in Southtown, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf involved in an incident at a hardware store today over face masks. Sheriff Javier Salazar is describing it as an assault. Salazar said Wolf was shopping at the Lowe's at I-10 in Callahan when another customer became irate after an employee told him he needed to wear a mask, something required by an order that Wolf issued last week. That video you, sh you just saw shows the judge trying to hand the man a business card before the customer then slaps it down. That's the only physical contact the sheriff told media about today, though he said a pretty loud confrontation followed that. He called me on the on the phone it's almost immediately after and put me on speaker so that I could hear what was going on. So, yeah, absolutely. I could hear that this suspect knew exactly who he was dealing with. He knew exactly what was being asked of him and he wasn't going to comply. Wolf was able to get the man's license plate when he left. So the sheriff says they know who this man is. The sheriff's office has not yet announced any arrests. And some local businesses have a new supply of face masks provided by Bear County. This mask giveaway is part of a bigger plan to distribute 1 million masks to local businesses in the county. More than 3,300 businesses registered to receive those packages today. Each business received 100 masks while supplies lasted. County officials say it's the least they could do to help both keep businesses open and workers safe. Uh, we're hopeful that we can remain, uh, have the economy remain open, um, but do it in a safe manner. And, and I think uh, we're just doing our part to make sure that businesses have the supplies they need for, uh, for, for people to participate and to support them in our local economy. The county was able to pay for the masks through the CARES Act stimulus package.
New at 6, CASA of Central Texas reporting that they need double the number of volunteers they have now in order to meet the needs of child abuse victims in our area. CASA, which stands for Court, court Appointed Special Advocate, relies on volunteers to help children in the court system who need that additional advocate. And as Stephanie Serta reports, with this pandemic, it's been a challenge to recruit those volunteers. Extremely emotional. Uh, I can't extremely happy. CASA volunteer Sharon Miller tells us it was three years ago when she was assigned to Kim's case. And despite the pandemic, Kim, who is now 13 years old, was recently adopted. As the uh, judge was reading, you know, the final uh, order that she would be adopted, uh, I, I think every single one of us that were on that call, we, we were in tears. Volunteers are screened, trained, and appointed to children who have been removed from their home because of abuse or neglect. When there is a child in the court system who needs an additional advocate, someone to come in and tell the judge what's in the best interest of the child, the judge comes to their local CASA program. CASA of Central Texas covers all of Caldwell, Comal, Guadalupe, and Hayes counties. And during the pandemic, it became challenging for the court system, but also for volunteers to be there for the children. The challenge for us when COVID first hit was really, how are we going to maintain contact with these children if we're not allowed to see them? Volunteers have adapted and moved forward with Zoom, and court is now being held online. And although nine new volunteers were sworn in yesterday, CASA is still looking for more. One of the other challenges that we've had, too, is just recruiting more volunteers. Volunteers like Sharon, who can make a difference in a child's life. Because it was such a special day, I actually uh, had a gift for the child on my case that got adopted. At least it was a, an opportunity to actually see her in person at that time. Stephanie Serna, KSAT 12 News. COVID-19 concerns have forced the cancellation of the city's 4th of July Woodlawn Lake fireworks show. That's expected to make this a banner holiday for area fireworks distributors. Paul Venemont explains as he checks in on sales at one fireworks store. From the moment the doors opened here, it was clear that this will likely be a booming 4th of July holiday for this place. Winston Bray was among the day's first customers. We're still going to have probably like a friend or two over because we usually do that. But yeah, it's not going to be like we usually do. We have a ton of friends. Yeah, it'll definitely be different. Different, he says, due to COVID-19 concerns. What better to socially distance than to go out and do something that you have to socially distance on, which is shoot fireworks. Girdley said that the cancellation of public shows should be good for business. Instead of going to those shows, they come out and they, they buy it and do it themselves. So we, we see an uptick in sales. But as you can see, sales and the safe use of fireworks aren't the only thing that they're focused on here. We have uh, social distancing set up at all of our stands. In our buildings, we have limited occupancy. Uh, everybody has a mask, we're in a required mask. From now until the 4th of July, the sale of fireworks is legal in Bear County, but the sale and use of fireworks inside the San Antonio city limits is illegal. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. New at 6, protecting against COVID-19 has become an even bigger priority as the numbers continue to climb. Jesse Degariato says that's why robots like this one with high intensity ultraviolet lights are being used more and more to kill any trace of COVID-19. Manufactured in San Antonio, demand for Xenex's germ zapping robots started soon after the pandemic hit. Literally hundreds of robots being shipped all over the world. Robots like this one, known for the powerful xenon UV light used in hospitals. It's very intense. It's very fast, two minutes to disinfect. So intense, no one can be in the same room with the robot. In response to COVID-19 cases on the rise in Texas and other states, Xenex created a strike force to meet a wider demand, like at this upscale steak restaurant. So we're doing this in restaurants, we're doing it in daycares, we're doing it in gymnasiums, office buildings, all sorts of places. Even homes, so many that he says they can't always offer next day service. That's why many businesses have the robots do this on a weekly basis, like here at Bohannon's, on top of its own measures to protect its guests and employees. I think we've all stepped it up and learning each and every way how we can uh, stay ahead of it. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. And if you're wondering how much it could cost to bring in one of those germ zapping robots, we've got that information on KSET.com. All right. Look outside with live cam right now. Of course, 
It's hot, it's muggy, but it's the stuff in the air today, Adam, that I think has some people talking. Yeah, particularly the mold's a lot higher today, and there's a little bit of African dust, just a trace of it, not really noticeable out there, but it's the mold that's way up. The aquifer, it's up a bit too, this is good. It responded to yesterday's rainfall. It's up six tenths of a foot, so we're 661.0. That's nice. All right, here's a look at our pollen count. It's very high, the mold that is, count of over 15,000. Today, decent amount of sunshine out there, some high thin clouds and some low patchy clouds. 92 is our high temperature. That's almost exactly average, the average being 93. And we started the day at 70. It was a nice start to the day. Right now, temperatures hovering around the 90 degree mark from 85 in Canyon Lake to 92 in Floresville to 89 in Tarpley, 91 in Floresville and 89 that was in Pleasanton. All right, looking at temperatures this evening will gradually fall through the 80s, settle down in the 70s by early tomorrow morning. Overall, pretty uneventful this evening, just a stray shower farther east, generally Lavaca County area and points eastward, and then a calm wind. But rain chances are looking more promising. We're going to talk more about that coming right up. We're waiting for our daily briefing from City Hall with County Judge Nelson Wolf and Mayor Ron, Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Nuremberg. Let's listen County in. Judge Nelson Wolf, along with Mario Martinez, Assistant Director of San Antonio Metro Health. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight, we are reporting 347 new cases of COVID-19 in Bear County. That brings our total to 7,814 since this crisis began. We also have four new COVID-related deaths to report, bringing our total to 104 uh, since it began here in San Antonio. The first reported death is a white male in his 50s who was hospitalized at UHS. The, his, the second, a Hispanic male in his 50s uh, who had been hospitalized at Methodist. And the remaining two deaths were associated with congregate facilities, the Rio facility you may have heard of uh, about a month or so ago. Um, these were uh, it, these patients were in River City and they were designated, our designated isolation uh, facility for nursing home patients that had tested positive. Uh, the first patient was a white male in his 80s and a second was a white male in her 90s. Um, and I do want to say uh, again, we are tracking all of the, uh, the patients and, and uh, investigations going on. We do want to offer our sincerest condolences to the families of those loved ones who have lost. As you know, we're also closely monitoring our hospitals and that's really uh, the bottom line here is we want to make sure that we are protecting our hospitals and the folks that work in there uh, to ensure that we're able to treat those who do turn up ill. We do have 37 more COVID positive patients in the hospital tonight, and that brings our total to 555. That's quite a leap from where we were just a week or so ago. 164 are in intensive care. That's up 18 from yesterday, and 82 are on ventilators, up three from yesterday. In terms of capacity, we are still reporting 69% of ventilators available. It's dipped below 70% for the first time and hospitals are at 25% uh, of staffed hospital beds available. So the hospital system as a whole uh, continues to be under high stress. So we are working with them uh, to ensure that they are beginning their surge capacity planning. I'll turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Come back with a little bit more. Judge. Well, uh, let me thank the hospitals for what they're doing. Uh, they're adding some bed capacity uh, as, as they've grown. They've had to make some really hard decisions in um, holding off operations that people really ought to be getting uh, so that they can continue to keep the capacity for COVID uh, uh, patients. So uh, it's not, it's a hard job they're doing. I mean, just think you got 555 patients in the hospitals here and you have to, all the precautionary methods that have to take in place for the nurses, the attendants, the doctors, uh, very, very difficult job. And so we thank them very much for uh, what they're doing and how they're stepping up to help in this case. Um, we are continuing to uh, uh, check on various businesses out in the community uh, as they're going through um, trying to uh, comply with the uh, new order that the mayor and I put out uh, with respect to uh, people using masks within the business. Uh, in the last three days, we've called on 405 businesses uh, through the Sheriff's Department, Sheriff Salazar's people. Uh, they found the vast majority are in compliance. Uh, they did find some without signs, but they take the signs along and they help them put it up. Uh, if anybody inside there that um, 
is working there, uh, you know, doesn't have a mask on, they make sure they are, and they, 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 it's an education phase, I guess you would call it, and they feel very good about what the businesses are saying and what they're trying to do. And we know that's a difficult task for them, and we appreciate very much uh, what they're doing in helping us to contain this. We all know that uh, we'd prefer not to be able to, not doing this, uh, we prefer that, you know, you could do what you want to do, but we are in a crisis. Uh, I think it's, what is it, Texas, Arizona, California, Florida, uh, just exponentially, exponentially uh, exploding. I think there were some states considering not letting anybody from Texas come in unless they quarantine themselves. So we have a big issue here, and uh, we need to do our part here in San Antonio. So we just plead with everybody to... Uh, Please recognize that and to help us uh, get out of this uh, real deep trouble we're in right now. Yeah. Thank you, Judge. And there, there is simply no doubt, and there's no other way of putting this, that the, this virus has a grip on the state of Texas. In fact, we reported just about 5,500 new cases, an all-time high in the state of Texas. I've talked to my peers in other cities, and they're experiencing the same uh, kind of stress level in their hospitals and their community with regard to this virus as we are. And so it's incumbent upon all of us to do what we can. Unfortunately, the, the state's orders have now had to f uh, have us focus on some of these other measures like what we're doing with the mask order and businesses. And I did want to report to you, we've made 142 calls today, 98 just for masks, and we did observe 15 violations. Uh, these are going to be progressively enforced, so we need to do all we can. If you're patronizing an establishment, wear your mask when you're inside and when, you're in, when you can't keep up physical distancing, even outside, wear your mask. But we've got to all do our part. Before we go to questions, I want to take a moment to encourage all of you, uh, all of re our residents, to take a, a take our survey on next year's city budget, which does have a lot to do with our pandemic recovery strategy as well. The city council meets this Friday to lay out the goals for the budget, and this is going to be a challenging time as we recover, as we get through um, the health aspects of this and also into the recovery, uh, as the COVID-19 crisis has created a projected $110 million revenue shortfall over the next two years for the city. So we do really need to hear from you about that and what's important to you. The budget survey is now up on SA speakup.com and that's again sapeakup.com as far as the covid-19 updates you can subscribe on text by texting cosa gov to 55000 and you also go on our website covid19.sanantonio.gov we do have assistant director mario martinez here and judge wolf and i are also available Questions. Four new deaths reported today because of COVID-19 here in Bear County. The total number of cases now 7,814, 347 new from just yesterday. That is up from yesterday's total of new cases. And the number of hospitalizations again continues to rise now at 555 locally. Yeah, this virus has a grip on the state of Texas. That's what the mayor just said moments ago. And County Judge Nelson Wolf, 405 businesses that have been visited uh, by the sheriff's department. The vast majority of them, he says, are in compliance. He did not talk about the incident at Lowe's that happened today about the uh, man who was aggressive with him after uh, he tried to help out a uh, person, an employee at Lowe's tell this person to wear a mask. I'm imagining that question is coming up, though. So, of course, we'll have much more on what the county judge has to say tonight on the night beat at 10. And also want to mention we are expecting to hear from the mayor a little bit later in this newscast. We'll be right back. And new WBA Super Flyweight Champion of the World, Joshua and Pronto. And new are two words every boxer wants to hear. Joshua Franco did last night becoming a new world champion in big board sports. As the Spurs gear up for Orlando to resume the NBA's regular season, point guard DeJounte Murray is speaking out on the season and racism in America. Murray told Yahoo Sports' Chris Haynes that he didn't know if they were going to play again this season and that he didn't really understand the coronavirus until some people he knows caught it. Now, the two also talked about police brutality and the death of George Floyd that sparked outrage across the United States and around the world. Plus, Murray also opened up on his own personal experiences with racism and cops. 
it's sad, but it's been happening. Like mm-hmm. even you know on the streets, I know cricket cops from from where I'm from that killed themselves because they were so cricket and taking stuff from us, beating up on us, and and they got exposed. And now it's like you about to go to jail and be on the front line where all yeah. these dudes you used to rob and yeah, up, wait for you here, and they kill themselves. Like mm-hmm. so, it's been it's been it's been happening. It's been happening. You know, and now it's just it's being recorded now. Free agent center Tyler Zeller signed with the Spurs for the remainder of the season. The team announced via email he will wear number 40. Zeller is 30 years old and a six-year NBA vet. The Spurs will not have LaMarcus Aldridge for the rest of the season because he underwent surgery on his right shoulder earlier this month. So the team has a huge hole to fill in the front court. Wagner High School grade and Stanford star guard Kiana Williams has been in San Antonio area since early March. And she said she's glad to be home. Yes, she loves Stanford and playing ball for the Cardinal, but said she's a Texas girl at heart and just joys being back. We caught up with Kiana at Alamo City All-Star Sportsplex off of 1604 in Universal City, where she often plays ball alongside some of the area's best. Kiana has seen a lot of cool things while playing ball in California and traveling the country. So we asked her about her wow moment when it comes to meeting famous people. One time the Warriors came to Stanford, they were practicing and uh, literally KD and uh, when KD was playing with the Warriors and uh, Curry, they were literally like right there shooting and working out uh, and I was just in awe just watching them, They the, like they wouldn't miss. So that was extremely hum- uh, humbling and Steve Kerr uh, came and talked to us, okay. um, Condoleezza Rice, she comes to our games and stuff and, and talks to us. So Stanford is, a, is an incredible place and you never know who you're going to bump into. We'll have much more with Kiana Williams in the coming days, including her game-winning shot at Colorado back in February. Earlier this month, San Antonio boxer Joshua Franco told us he would not leave the ring without a world title, and the young man lived up to those words. Last night in in Las Vegas, in the main event, he beat undefeated Andrew Maloney to win the WBA Super Flyweight Championship of the World. The fight was close early on before Franco seized control of the win by unanimous decision, improving to 17-1-2. Josh is the toast of the town, and fellow 210 boxer Hector Tanahata Jr. posted this pick on Twitter last night alongside the new champion. For more on Joshua, check out our story on KSAT.com on the sports page. And notice both of those guys are wearing masks. They were indeed. Yeah, mask up. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. A dire warning from the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, saying we are heading into a critical two-week period in this coronavirus pandemic. He says there is a disturbing surge in COVID-19 infections, particularly in places like right here in Texas, in Arizona, and in Florida. As ABC's Rena Roy reports, the number of confirmed cases in the U.S. is closing in on two and a half million. As more than half the nation sees an increase in COVID-19 cases, Uh, the governors of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, which have made major progress in reopening plans, are now taking drastic steps to keep their numbers down. Today, issuing a travel advisory for states with high infection rates. At least nine are impacted, including Arizona, Florida, and Texas. People coming in from states that have a high infection rate must quarantine for 14 days. It's only for the simple reason that uh, we worked very hard to get the viral transmission rate down. Dr. Anthony Fauci warning we are still in the first wave and community spread is climbing. The next couple of weeks are going to be critical in our ability to address those surgings. Recent models show Florida could be the next epicenter as the state hits record daily highs. The governor acknowledging the recent surge points to an escalation in transmission over the last week or so, now cracking down on bars defying rules. If you go in and it's just like mayhem, like Dance Party USA, no tolerance for that. Just suspend the license. Texas setting its own grim records, reporting nearly 5,500 cases in one day.
We have seen hospitalizations triple across the board. We are able to care for the patients who are coming to us, but of course we're concerned with the trend lines we're seeing. In Washington State's Yakima County, officials say the hospital system is at capacity with no rooms available. There's strains of many parts of the system that we're trying to answer and figure out. Arizona, also a hot spot. President Trump held a campaign rally last night in Phoenix. Thousands attending, many without masks. Health experts calling it a potential super spreader event. The same criticism given to Trump's rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma last Saturday. Hospitals running out of staff. Nearly every single ICU bed filled. I wish I can convey to you the fear that I feel sometimes when I see patients looking so sick. Meantime, the European Union is considering banning all non-essential travel from any countries that have a worse infection rate than Europe beginning July 1st. Right now, that ban would include the U.S. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. It appears there are some unhappy people at the happiest place on Earth. More than 7,000 employees of Walt Disney World say that they are worried about reopening. They've signed an online petition saying, quote, this virus is not gone. Unfortunately, it's only become worse in this state, end quote. As the park preps for a phased reopening beginning July 11th, Disney officials say measures are being taken to reopen safely. But staffers who signed that petition are hoping they'll reconsider, saying it's not fair to ask the people who work there to risk their lives. About 10 percent of Disney's workforce has signed this particular petition. There's a similar one by Disneyland workers in California, which has nearly 50,000 signatures. Another national chain filing for bankruptcy, GNC, says it will close up to 1,200 stores. Company officials say the 85-year-old vitamin and dietary supplement company is struggling with nearly a billion dollars of debt. GNC has faced declining sales at its brick-and-mortar location since before the pandemic, but stay-at-home orders have had a dramatic negative impact on its business. GNC will keep operating, but it will become a much smaller company. The hope is to emerge from bankruptcy in the fall. It looks like scammers are going after the unemployed during this pandemic. According to a new report from the Better Business Bureau, more than half of the people targeted by employment scams are unemployed. The BBB study looked at scammers who pretended to be representatives of well-known businesses, then tricked victims into sending them money by claiming to be offering them a job. 53% of the victims of these scams were unemployed when they were targeted. Nearly three-fourths of those who lost money in the scam say they already did not have enough income to cover their monthly bills. All right, if you suffer from allergies, you probably noticed there was one in particular out there today. Oh, and it is high, Adam. Actually, in the very high category. Technically speaking, it is, yeah. Uh, the mold pollen or mold uh, spores, I should say, are way up there today with the count of 14 to 15,000. It's high, and that's because of the rain that we recently had. And the aquas aquifer responded nicely to that rain up over half a foot today. Not expecting much in terms of rain this evening or tonight. Most of the day tomorrow is going to be dry, but rain chances are looking promising, especially as we get into Friday. The situation is looking a little bit better with one wild card. That's important to talk about, so let's get right into it. Right now on the radar screen, a little bit of activity far east of San Antonio and of course far south, a little closer to the valley and even along parts of the coastline. But you see a few little showers have popped up and just barely clipped Lavaca County here over the past couple of hours. But that's it. Nothing major to speak of out there. and We're not expecting much else really the rest of the evening and into tonight. Just a slight chance far east of town. And that's in response to this upper level disturbance, that counterclockwise swirl. Good rain producer yesterday in East Texas even triggered some showers around here and today caused more areas of rain. This is just over the past eight hours. You see that good production of rainfall, but that's really not going to be all that consequential for us as we get on into really tomorrow. What we're looking at here is on into Friday. This disturbance here over the southern Gulf of Mexico, it's out of radar range for the most part, so you don't see much in terms of rain on the radar screen, but the satellite imagery is indicating it's fairly efficient in producing some showers and storms. We're going to get a piece of that moist moisture and a little bit of the energy from it as we get into Friday, which should boost our rain chances a little bit. Now, here's just one computer representation as we get into tomorrow. By the afternoon hours, the typical pop up activity coming in from the coastal plain and the coastline 3 p.m. widely separated. You go through 5, 6 p.m. widely separated. Then the sun sets and you lose all the activity. 
about 40% coverage tomorrow, and that may be on the high end. And then we get into Friday, a little more in terms of cloud cover, and we're thinking better rain chances. We'll have deeper moisture, a little bit of energy, and this model may be overdoing it a little bit. Okay, this may be a little aggressive. Nonetheless, it shows the trend here that yeah, it's the odds are more likely as we get into Friday, just due to more factors coming into play, especially this disturbance you see right here over the southern Gulf. But the wild card is all this dust in the air. This can some, sometimes inhibit those showers from really flaring up and developing and becoming very widespread and numerous. However, I don't anticipate the dust to be so thick over South Texas that our showers can't overcome it. But what it could do is make for some of those dusty and muddy downpours that we sometimes see around here. Usually that's from West Texas dust, but this time it would be courtesy of the Saharan Desert. Look at the temperatures across the state, some 80s, some 90s, and even one triple digit reading. That's Del Rio to 102. Laredo, 91. 89 here in San Antonio and Pleasanton checking in at 93. Not overly humid. That northerly breeze kicked in yesterday, or I should say last night. And today felt a little different out there because we didn't have that oppressive humidity in place. It's going to return though. The wind kicks in off the Gulf of Mexico again tomorrow and the humidity will be on the rise. 73 in the morning and then 94 by tomorrow afternoon. A mixture of sun and clouds. Minimal rain chances the first part of the day, and then just for about three or four hours, we'll boost it up to a 40% chance in the afternoon. Again, more promising as we get into Friday. Right now we have it at that scattered category at about 50%, and then the rain chances really fall off as we get into the weekend and even next week. Reason for that, big upper level high, the heat high, the blue H, that's going to be parked pretty much right overhead. Rain chances and temperatures not too bad. Thanks, Adam. We talk with Mayor Ron Nuremberg live coming up next. In today's KSAT Q&A, we are joined by Mayor Ron Nuremberg, who just moments ago earlier in this show gave the latest numbers on the continued spread of COVID-19 here in San Antonio. Mayor, thanks for being with us. Those numbers keep on rising and especially those numbers of people hospitalized. Is there something that you feel like San Antonians just aren't necessarily getting about the spread of this virus? You know, it's tough, Myra, because, um, you know, the effects of our decisions in terms of how we see the infection rate, uh, we feel the effects of our decisions in two and three weeks later. So, you know, I, I think these last couple of weeks have really rattled everybody because we see how quickly the cases are rising, particularly the hospital numbers. And I am starting to see uh, more concern. I'm seeing people, you know, want to get tested. I'm seeing more masks. I'm seeing the physical distancing become much more in the front of people's minds again. So I think we're starting to see people make corrections, but that doesn't unfortunately take care of what happened two weeks ago. And so we're going to start to see, we're going to see uh, these numbers rise uh, for for a couple of weeks more. And hopefully the, the, the decisions that we're making now are smarter and we can start to get a grip on this virus. I know that you, you mentioned in the news conference today that you've talked to other mayors from major Texas cities and you kind of share the same sentiments. What can be done more than what you're doing right now? You know, it would be great if we could, um, with the state's cooperation, have a little bit more locally focused action. Uh, unfortunately, with the state's blanket orders, they really handcuff local communities from uh, make it, making quick decisions and, and taking local action to limit the spread of, you know, in particular hotspots. The, the mask order, for instance, was after a lot of political wrangling, finally finding a path for us to mandate masks again. But we know that's one of the best ways we can slow the spread of the virus. So, uh, you know, I've said from the very beginning, as Texas was beginning to open up, we don't have the benefit of data to to. Uh, verify that we're making good decisions. And so we're starting to see the effects of us opening up too fast. So our hope, uh, you know, as mayors, I would say, is to have a little bit more locally focused action and local control and, and slow this down a little bit because we're just blowing through each phase of these opening, uh, of the various opening uh, of services and businesses that is causing people to lower their guard. And, and I think you're starting to see the results of that. 
the use of face masks has become divisive for a lot of people. You, you heard about what happened with uh, Judge Nelson Wolf earlier today. We report, reported it here, the confrontation he got in with a customer at a store who refused to put on a mask. Tensions are high right now, uh, not only about the masks, but just the stress of this pandemic. What was your reaction to what happened there? No, people are anxious. Um, you know, they've had to be confined in their homes. People have lost their jobs. We've seen livelihoods, um, you know, almost vanish. And, you know, the stress level is extraordinarily high. And so when you layer on mandates from government, it doesn't it doesn't help people feel better. Uh, you know, but but the truth of the matter is this is about saving people's lives and 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 maintaining the health of the community. We don't want to do these orders uh, any more than people want to have them imposed on them. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, with regard to mask wearing, it's this is public health guidance. It's one of the best ways we can slow the virus. And unfortunately, politics as it is, uh, partisan uh, partisanship has entered into the conversation now. And you have people equating wearing a mask with individual liberty, which is absurd. Wearing a mask is protecting other people from you if you are protect you potentially carrying the virus. It's a sign of respect. It's a very simple thing we can do to help our communities, our businesses reopen in a safe and healthful way. And, and it, it shouldn't be politicized. This is simple public health guidance that we can get on board and, and really start to um, help our businesses, help each other. Uh, and and I, you know, I, really, I really believe that the San Antonio community is hearing that message by and large. Uh, we just have to continue to work together. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back with the mayor. We're back with Mayor Ron Nuremberg live after his briefing today. Mayor, are we, are we and I want to say the media, elected officials, you name it, are we not doing a good enough job conveying just how serious this illness is, what it does to the body, what it does you know, to the society that we live in? Um. No, I wouldn't say that at all. I think, you know, people are, are being bombarded. They have been for three and four months now uh, with this. And, and, you know, the danger is we hear about it every day. We hear about it on, on you know, in various ways. It becomes sort of background noise uh, for folks, especially if politics starts to twist some of the message. Uh, that's the danger. What, what, what I hope we can accomplish, though, is, us for, is for us to ensure that we're consistently putting our medical experts and public health officials in position to deliver the, the truth, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of this virus and what we can do to protect ourselves, our families, and our businesses. And that's really uh, our focus. Um, but, you know, we, we've got to keep people's attention on this. I think, you know, the media locally are reporting it and, and, and just the way we would want to. Uh, and we're also all learning about this, by the way. It's a novel virus. There's a lot to learn from a medical aspect, but also in terms of the, you know, the public information. And, and I think we're working together in that way. We just got to continue to do it. Can you quickly tell us what you're hearing about the hospital capacity right now? Because that hospitalization number continues to go up and up and up. It, it does. And, and that's the acceleration of the rates, uh, acceleration of the, of the infection rates are what are, is really concerning because we do have capacity in the hospitals. Uh, we have a healthy number of staff hospital beds. Uh, we still have a healthy number of ventilators. We still have a healthy number of ICU uh, available. And, and so that is good as a snapshot, but we're seeing this infection rate rise so quickly that that can turn in a heartbeat. And so what the hospitals are being forced to do is go through their surge planning right now in some cases defer some procedures so that they can make space for COVID patients. Um, and, and then in other cases, we're, we're having to look at when we're gonna trigger alternative care facilities. So all of this is a work in progress and it's, and it's a dynamic situation, but it is concerning how fast these infections have risen over the last couple of weeks. And what we can do as a community is slow that down. That's exactly what flattening the curve was all about. Mayor Ron Nuremberg, appreciate your time. And of course, we'll see you back here tonight on the Night Beat. I want to talk about the pandemic and the budget and priorities and how that all plays out. So thanks for your time, Mayor. Thanks, y'all. We'll be right back.
voting by mail. It used to be just an option for some in Texas, but now it's a controversy. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, there's the concern that people gathering at the ballot box will help spread the virus. The pandemic has a lot of people worried about the safety of in-person voting. Never before have Americans been asked to vote and to put their life in risk. So could mail-in voting be an alternative? The thought that somehow there's going to be a lot of voter fraud um, is not there. Evidence is not there. But critics are concerned, including Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. He actually filed a brief to prevent fraud through the expansion of mail-in voting. And that's propelling this issue to be not only a controversy, but a partisan one that's currently tied up in court. Case that explains mail-in voting. Seventy three in the morning tomorrow, mid 90s by the afternoon, a little extra humidity in the air and some scattered showers and non severe storms just for the afternoon and early evening hours. But better chances as we get into Friday. That's the way it looks right now. And we'll keep you updated on that situation and only near 90 for the high on Friday. But then rain chances really get turned off into the weekend and especially next week. And no coincidence, then temperatures go up. Yeah, it looks like we're heading into July next week. Triple digits of Capricorn. See you at 10.